Welcome everybody to the prosecution and defense of physicians in civil and criminal opioid cases. We have with us today some very distinguished speakers. I want to tell you who they are. We're all from New York, by the way. And I want to thank the ABA for doing this today. This is a wonderful, wonderful program. We have about three to 400 attendees, but each of our speakers have been allotted about 15 to 19 minutes. And it becomes very important for you to take a look at your program materials. So first, I'm Tom Liotti. I'm a practicing lawyer in Garden City, Long Island, New York. I've tried cases virtually everywhere in the country. Uh, Mark Taft uh, is an MD and he's a retired medical examiner who's done probably more autopsies than anybody in the country. He's amazing, okay? And we've got Erica Dubno here, who is a former partner with Harold Price Farringer, one of the leading appellate lawyers in the country. And I knew him when he was also a trial lawyer, but he's only had 15 cases before the Supreme Court of the United States and won 13 of them. Uh, and Erica was at his side for many of those cases. And she'll be talking to you today about some of the legal issues involved in these cases. And, defending and prosecuting these cases. Joe DeFelice has probably tried more homicide cases than anybody on the face of the planet. Uh, so he is just an extraordinary, extraordinary lawyer. And you'll be hearing from him about trial techniques in a few minutes. Now, just to give you an overview of what we're talking about here, I'd like to uh, direct your attention to an article that I penned back in October of 2018 on defending physicians in opioid death cases. So that gives you a very, very good overview together with some of the other materials that we have for you today. Now, I want you to think of these cases as really homicide cases because they are very, very serious cases and you're gonna need a lot of ammunition on your part if you're prosecuting or you're a plaintiff's lawyer or you're a defense counsel. So not yet. Um, so what I would like you to do is just focus on the fact that these are very, very serious homicide cases. So we're talking about cases where you sometimes have more than one death. So you've got multiple homicide cases that you're focusing on. And this makes it a very, very serious matter for physicians whose licenses are on the line and their whole career is on the line. And if they get convicted, of course, they're looking at virtually life sentences, but a minimum probably of 20 to life. So these are cases that you really need to pay very careful attention to. The good news is that you're gonna be able to charge a lot of money for representing physicians in these types of cases. The reason for that is that you're gonna need experts. Dr. Taft, who's with us today, is one of the experts that you may want to need on your cases, but you're definitely gonna need a medical examiner, you're gonna need a, a toxicologist probably, and you're also gonna need someone who can testify about the standards for prescribing opioid medication. So all of those experts cost money naturally. And I'm gonna tell you that if you wanna represent your clients successfully, I have a quote here from Harold Price Farringer, who was a great trial lawyer, Erica's former partner, who's now deceased, unfortunately. But he said back in 1975 that you could, do, could not do a murder case, at least not in New York, for less than $75,000. So the price tag on these cases for really representing physicians appropriately and properly is somewhere between 500,000 and a million dollars. Okay, that's what I would suggest that you have in your bank and maybe you'll become an owner of your, your client's house and home and car and everything else, but you're gonna need a lot of money to probably defend on these cases. The biggest problem that you have on these cases is the negative publicity that surrounds them. So as of 2018, I'm not quite sure what the number is right now, but there were over 200,000 opioid death cases out there. 
And this, of course, signal a major crisis in, uh, in uh, the field. And also, uh, you know, there was a, a time when uh, Donald Trump appointed a special commission to look at these cases and address what became of them and uh, the crisis that was involved. Um, so that's the biggest problem that we have. So the biggest problem that we have is the negative publicity that's out there and all the deaths surrounding that. And people form an impression, obviously, before they come into the jury box about these things. And so do judges and so do prosecutors. So you really have an uphill fight and you have to figure out ways to address that negative publicity. And you have to turn it in your favor for the physician that you're representing. So I'm suggesting to you that there are a number of things that you can do. And one of those things is just doing op-ed pieces by yourself or by your client, and also having focus groups, or if you can do it, as we did in one of our cases, you might wanna get in touch with Crime Watch or other television programs and see if they would do a television show on your client. And your client will then present his best, best picture uh, and uh, his office and his practice would be presented in the most pristine fashion that you can muster. And after that, you can uh, also have a call-in uh, where you know the television show would uh, have call-ins from listeners and so on and viewers. And sometimes while you can't, necessarily rely on that impression, but you might figure out what your strategy will be uh, based on the reaction that you get from those television shows. Um, so we were in one case on Crime Watch uh, with Amy Dash as a moderator. We thought that our client was going to get an acquittal, uh, but of course he didn't later on, uh, but we got a 99% reaction from people that our client was not guilty. So we had a clue from that, that we were on the right track from a legal standpoint, from a legal strategy standpoint. Now, the next thing I wanted to say about overcoming some of this negative publicity is, you've got jurors there that have a preconceived notion about your client uh, and <clears throat> you need to, think about how you can change that. So in federal court, of course, they have juror questionnaires and you can participate in the formulation of questions for the judge to ask. And what you want to get the judge to do is not to just ask questions that call for a didactic response from uh, the audience or the prospective jurors. You want the jurors to say why they can be fair. So you ask a lot of why questions in your voir dire or your proposed voir dire questions for the court. Or if you're doing it, and I suggest to you that some judges, federal judges included, will allow you to conduct your own voir dire. And those are the points that you really want to get across. Why can they be fair to your client, given all of the negative publicity that's out there? Now, I want to talk about a few other things. When you first meet your client, let's talk about, uh, let's go past money. Uh, let's talk about the client and his appearance, all right? So now let's focus on that for a minute. So what does your client look like? What does his office look like? Does his office uh, give the appearance of a pristine, good practice? Uh, what, what kind of a volume does he have? How many patients does he treat every day? And most importantly, what percentage of his practice deals with the prescribing of opioid medication? So, uh, you know, the government will say that the percentages are very, very high and they can monitor the number of prescriptions that have been given out uh, by your physician. So it's important for you to focus on that right away. You wanna look at also the records that your physician has kept uh, and whether they're 
good records or bad records, complete records, and so on. What kind of examinations does he conduct, conduct or he, she conducts before they prescribe opioid medication? This becomes a, a critical point because later on, when you're looking at this case and you're looking at videos, let's say, that the government has prepared um, um, about your examinations and your client and so forth, and the agents come into your client's office basically trying to do a sting on your client uh, and setting your client up for prosecution, you want to basically look at those examinations to see if they're complete examinations. So I'm not talking about just uh, blood pressure and heart rate and so on. I'm talking about whether your, your client has spent enough time with the prospective patient before prescribing pain medication. And of course, if your client is taking cash, and let's say uh, in our case, for example, the, the client uh, received $425 on a first visit, and then I think $275 in cash thereafter. So cash is a bugaboo in these cases. You don't want to have a client accepting cash. You want uh, patients to be prescribed medication through Medicare or through their insurance and so forth. But that becomes very important because the pharmacies will report exactly how many prescriptions have been written in these cases. And it becomes a disaster for your client if they have incomplete records and they're accepting cash on top of that. So you want to make sure that your client has filed tax returns and that whatever cash he's made is somehow reflected on those tax returns. If not, then you need to have an explanation for that. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. I want to talk about mapping your strategy and what you're trying to do in, the, in these cases is without saying it, because you can't say that you're interested in, in nullifying uh, the law on these cases, but basically that's what you're trying to do. You want to try and blame the government for what's happened. You want to try and blame Big Pharma for what's happened. And lo and behold, if you really do your homework on these cases, you'll be able to find out who, who your experts are on the other side of things, and you'll be able to research whether they've written any articles, and you'll be able to compile some impeachment material about them. Um, so there's a great lawyer up in Buffalo, New York. His name is Mark Mahoney, who's done an awful lot of research on the presentment of a defense on these cases. So he's got about 500 pages, so we didn't give you that as part of your seminar materials, but I'm sure Mark Mahoney up in Buffalo, New York would be prepared uh, to send you uh, whatever you need in the, way, in the way of a right to present a defense. Now, let's focus on some of the other issues that you can uh, do and uh, you can engage in as far as blaming the government and uh, mapping your strategy on these cases. So you know that Big Pharma, in particular Purdue, uh, was manufactured oxycodone in 1995. And <clears throat> thereafter, they produced movies and so forth. And they said that only 1% of the people who were taking oxy at that point uh, would be in danger of being addicted. And that's how they marketed the drug back then. Uh, and that, of course, became a problem because physicians were then misled in their prescribing of medication and opioid medication. And many people died as a result of Big Pharma and Purdue in particular, misleading the public in that regard. Now, you might want to think about entrapment as a defense, and that has only been successful in a few cases, uh, but not these types of cases ordinarily. So you have to struggle with getting the entrapment charge. And that means that you have to sort of indicate a confession and avoidance type of defense. 
meaning that your client would not have been predisposed to prescribing the medication in the absence of the government's misconduct. Now, also, you may want to think about subpoenas for, in our case, for example, we tried to subpoena the Surgeon General of the United States, who is now our Surgeon General once again. And, and he's a great guy, but he also back in 2016, in August of 2016, just before Obama left uh, government, uh, he issued what was known as an apology letter to physicians and others, uh, patients included, uh, basically describing uh, that, you know, the government had screwed up in a sense by uh, not alerting people to the dangers of opioids and also by allowing Purdue and others to market these cases or these products with false advertising. So let's go to the next slide, which is part of your uh, strategy here. And believe it or not, the criminal cases and the civil cases go hand in glove with each other. And this is one of my favorite topics actually, because I always ask the experts, whether uh, they're plaintiff's experts or, or uh, uh, government experts, I ask them a question about reasonable degree of medical certainty because those words of art are often not used by the government's experts or the plaintiff's experts in these cases. So I always say to the experts, and this is a, a, a good point, I think, for you to write down and remember, but doctor, to, you testified that to a reasonable degree, degree of medical certainty that you have an opinion about thus and so. What is a reasonable degree of medical certainty and how does that compare with proof beyond a reasonable doubt? Now the judge will probably be all over you if you ask that question in that way, but you can still ask the question about reasonable degree of medical certainty. So what is the reliability of your opinion, doctor? Is it 60%, is it 70%? What is it exactly? And then you can drive home your point in a closing argument later on and Remember also this, and a lot of lawyers, even skilled malpractice lawyers, are not aware that there are two parts to a medical malpractice case. First, you have to show the negligence. And again, this works hand in glove with your portrayal of your client in a criminal case as well. But is, is there a duty? Was there a breach of duty? Is there proximate cause and damages? And then you look at if if the plaintiff can satisfy those criteria, then you go to but for. So but for that negligence, would the result have been different? So the plaintiff has to prove that. And basically what, when Dr. Taff is speaking to you in a few minutes, he's gonna be talking to you about cause of death. So if the cause is related to some other uh, problem other than the negligence of the doctor, that's something that you wanna zero in on on a criminal case and also a plaintiff's case or, or a defendant's case. Lastly, I wanted to just mention to you collateral action because when you're defending these cases, sometimes lawyers think sort of myopically and they don't consider alternative uh, actions and collateral actions in particular. Are there any cases out there where you might intervene? Are there any cases where you should be filing a notices of claim against the government or against even state authorities. So those collateral actions have to be considered, I think also very, very much so. All right, so I think we're gonna move on now to Erica Dubno. And uh, Erica, you take it away, girl. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Tom, I really appreciate it. I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, and I hope that people are able to see. I have a PowerPoint presentation. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, I'm gonna be speaking more about the legal issues, less on the practical, um, but these are the legal issues uh, for what the prosecution has to establish in a federal criminal prosecution uh, for opioid uh, 
abuse and misuse uh, by a physician and more specifically in death cases. And we'll deal with that later on. Because of the breadth of this, there is possible to bring criminal ch charges in state cases. It's also possible to have civil. There are different districts, different circuits, and there's not a lot of uniform law from the US Supreme Court. So at the outset, it's critical that people research the issue in your particular jurisdiction, your state, your district, circuit, whatever it is, because I think that's absolutely critical. But some of the things I'm going to be talking about today are just sort of basic overall uh, propositions. And um, the first thing is it's governed by Section um, 21 U.S.C. 841, which is part of the Controlled Substances Act. And it doesn't provide much information, but what it says is it shall be unlawful for any person knowingly or intentionally to distribute or dispense a controlled substance. And since we're talking about physicians right here, you know, um, you know, we want more information, which is actually not really included within 841. Um, and the focus really turns to the Code of Federal Regulations. And there, there's more information. And it says a prescription for a controlled substance to be effective must be issued for a legitimate medical purpose by an individual practitioner acting in the usual course of his professional practice. Uh, and additionally, uh, the code provides that it's the responsibility for the proper prescribing and dispensing of controlled substances is upon the prescribing practitioner, but a corresponding responsibility rests with the pharmacist who fills the prescription. So um, understand that there are obligations both for the, the physician and also on uh, the pharmacist as well. Um, people here may be representing pharmacists. We've been contacted by pharmacists as well. So a lot of the ideas that we're talking about today relate to pharmacists as well. And if a prescription is issued without a legitimate medical purpose or place or outside the usual course of professional practice, the person filling the purported prescription, which would be the pharmacist, as well as the person issuing it would be the doctor, um, is subject to criminal penalties of 841. And as Tom pointed out, those penalties can be incredibly serious, especially where death or serious bodily injury is involved. Um, in 1975, the US Supreme Court in the Moore case, uh, there was a division as to whether doctors could actually be charged and the court determined, yes, registered physicians can be prosecuted under 841 where their activities fall outside the usual course of professional practice. So, the three basic burdens that a prosecutor has in federal criminal cop prosecutions um, for, for opioid cases is whether the defendant distributed or dispensed a controlled substance. Number two, whether the defendant's actions were not for legitimate medical purposes in the usual course of his or her professional <laughs> medical practice or were beyond the bounds of medical practice and that the defendant acted knowingly and, intentional, and or intentionally. Prosecutor has the burden of establishing all of these elements beyond a reasonable doubt. So the first factor is uh, whether or not the defendant distributed or dispensed a controlled substance. Relating to doctors, um, by the way, distributed and dispensed are defined terms in the statute. Um, relating to doctors, um, the courts have determined that the mere writing of the prescription and um, providing it to the patient, you do not have to actually hand it to them. It could be do, done electronically and transmitted to the pharmacy, but the actual writing of the prescription or issuing the prescription is as if you've handed the drugs directly to the patient. Um, and so that's the dispensing element there. Um, and a prescription is the written representation of the drug and enables its possessor to claim physical custody and control. So in death cases, obviously the patient already got the drugs, um, but it may be that a defendant or a physician can be charged where the patient never even picks up the, pharma the prescription from the pharmacy. Uh, the next question arises as to whether the actual drug that has been prescribed is a controlled substance and then subject to 841. The courts in general have determined, and this is a pattern jury instruction, um, that whether or not a specific drug is a controlled substance is a matter of law to be determined by the judge. However, whether or not the defendant actually dispensed that is a question of fact for the jury. Um, it's pretty straightforward on that. I mean, some of these obviously like fentanyl and oxy are controlled substances. You're not going to be able to attack it, but you may be able to attack some other types of medication 
as to whether or not they fall within 841 or their controlled substances. The second element that the prosecution has to establish is that the defendant, the pharmacist, the physician's actions were not for a legitimate medical purpose in the usual course of his or her professional medical practice um, or were beyond the bounds of medical practice. Now that's the hard one. Those phrases are not defined in the statute. Legitimate medical purpose, which is like the key to these kinds of cases is not defined. Um, and you know, the good news is that a physician may not be convicted if she made an honest effort to treat her patients in compliance with an accepted standard of medical practice. So the courts have basically determined um, that, and this is um, showing you an instruction, a pattern instruction, and you should certainly request these kind of um, instructions and make sure that the judge is clear in instructing the jury, you know, what the burdens are. Um, there's this concept of a good faith defense. And what's important to know is in these cases, it's not a defense that the defendant actually has to prove. Um, good faith is something the government basically has to disprove. <laughs> it's concept. Um, and it's the government has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, the doctor, knowingly and or deliberately dispensed a controlled substance and did so other than in good faith, in the usual course of professional practice and accordance with a standard of medical practice generally recognized and accepted. So it says generally recognized, um, you know, that's important um, because it's uh, evaluated on an objective standard, not a subjective standard. It's not what this doctor specifically, whether it's a subjective determination, you look sort of at like what, the, you know, the general thing would be for other physicians um, in the field. And um, so a negligent physician, you can be negligent um, and not necessarily be guilty of eight for violating 841, um, as long as your negligence was in good faith. Um, and, you know, I think that's a critical, critical thing. And a physician's departure from standard of care without more is that in and of itself is really not enough to sustain a conviction under 841. It may subject you to civil liability and it also may subject you to other criminal charges. And we'll talk about that in a little while, but it also could be a basis for a doctor losing their license. So there are a lot of consequences there. Now, good faith, like it's not defined, but there have been enough cases that have come down to really sort of get an understanding of what it is. And in general, and this is from another instruction, they say good faith means sort of good intentions and the honest exercise of good professional judgment as to a patient's medical needs. So it's it, there is sort of an observance of conduct that accords with what a physician should reasonably believe. It brings back the sort of standard of reasonableness, which is, you know, in so many different cases there, what a, you know, a physician should reasonably believe. And, you know, in determining that, um, the jurors should look at, and you should ask this for an instruction, that the jurors should consider all of the evidence in the case which relates to that conduct. And unless the jurors find beyond a reasonable doubt that the charge conduct was not done in good faith in the course of a medical practice, they must acquit. That's a great jury instruction. You certainly want to ask for that. So then the question is, so what kind of evidence should the prosecutor present and what kind of evidence should the defense try to present on the other side if you want to put on a case um, as to that there's no legitimate medical purpose? So. Some of these are things that Tom actually was just talking about, which are you know, very, very important. And it's critical when you do um, meet with your client to go through all of these different things. But also, if you do have clients who are physicians, you should advise them as to these things so that they avoid having these issues. Uh, there are people who represent a lot of doctors for various different things, and you may want to just sort of alert them to these. So, you know, an example would be that it's not for a legitimate medical purpose. Well, you didn't do any physical examinations. You never sought the patient's medical history. You know, so if somebody comes in and presents to a doctor and says, oh, my back is killing me and you don't examine their back, um, you don't ask about their medical history, how they pulled their back, whether they've taken other drugs before, you don't do an x-ray, you don't do a CT scan, an MRI, um, and you just sort of give them fentanyl patches and you say, sure, no problem. That's a, that's, that is a problem. <laughs> The other thing is where there's no logical relationship between the drugs that are being prescribed and the treatment. So if somebody comes in and says, 
doctor, I'm experiencing double vision and you give them a fentanyl patch, you know, it may well be that there's not a logical relationship between your double vision and the fentanyl patch. Similarly, where a doctor issues drugs or prescriptions to somebody that they know are going to be filtered to somebody else. So if somebody comes in, a woman's there with her boyfriend, the boyfriend looks strung out, he's got track marks on his arms and he keeps saying, you know, baby, where's the prescription? Baby, where's the prescription? It's a pretty good clue to the doctor that, um, that she knows that that prescription is gonna be going somewhere else and that the drugs are going. Another thing is prescriptions are usually for 30 days. And if you start renewing prescriptions every 14 days, you know, because the patient says, well, I lost the drugs, I've dropped it down the sink, you know, whatever it is, maybe one time it's reasonable to, to refill that. But if it keeps happening that they keep losing their prescriptions for some opioid, that's something that should be of concern. And additionally, where there are inordinately large quantities of controlled substances being prescribed in general, just sort of huge prescriptions, the number of prescriptions, say you have, you know, a, a podiatrist who's issuing like large numbers of, you know, oxy prescriptions when, you know, that's normally not in the area and all other physicians aren't issuing that, those kind of prescriptions. Um, and it's also a disproportionately large percentage of your practice. So, you know, it may well be that occasionally somebody needs a painkiller, but it shouldn't be that 80% of your, of your practice is issuing uh, fentanyl and oxy and things like that. As Tom mentioned, uh, taking cash, not taking insurance. Um, you know, listen, there are doctors who only take credit cards or cash and they're totally legitimate, but you know, it's certainly an indicia that there might be something of concern there. Um, also never even meeting the patient, you know, issuing the script without even meeting the patient. Uh, as Tom mentioned, um, no records at all, improper record keeping. Um, but then this is important, not suggesting an alternative, a sort of non-narcotic um, alternative. So for example, somebody with a back pain comes in and the doctor says, here, have a fentanyl patch without saying, hey, maybe, maybe try losing weight, come back to me after you've lost some weight, or maybe try physical therapy or try a brace or something along those lines. If you immediately jump toward issuing opioids, that could be viewed as <laughs> a problem for a doctor. Um, similarly, not talking about prior prescriptions um, and also not keeping a secure prescription pad. Um, a lot of Municipalities now require scripts, especially for opioids, to be electronically transmitted to pharmacies, and that's to stop drug um, uh, do doctor shopping, where uh, a patient goes to one doctor, says, you know, doc, this hurts, and they get the script, and then they go to another doc, doc and they get another script and another script. And so, you know, these are all indicia um, that a prosecutor could use to establish the case. If you do represent clients who are doctors who have not yet had charges against them, um, you may suggest that they review the uh, United States Department of Health and Human Services has issued um, a pain management best practices report. Um, it's available on the internet. And I realize my PowerPoint is not in your materials. So um, I'll show my email at the end. And if anyone wants a copy of this, I will absolutely send it to you. I'm sorry, I didn't get it in time. Um, question also is as to like, what is legitimate medical purposes? Well, it's not defined in the statute. So it's possible to argue that the statute is vague. Now, Claims have been made and, you know, some courts have upheld the statute as being not being vague, but you know what, it hasn't been decided by the US Supreme Court and you certainly want to make a record of it. And a, a claim of vagueness, um, you can certainly raise what's called the rule of lenity. Um, and the rule of lenity says that it's a judicial doctrine that says that where you have an ambiguity in a criminal statute, um, you know, and you're not really sure what exactly legitimate medical practices are, you should resolve any ambiguity in favor of the defendant. And certainly, if you're going to make a challenge to the statute, you certainly want to include in the rule of lenity. The third element that a prosecutor has to establish beyond a reasonable doubt is obviously mens rea, that the defendant acted knowingly and or intentionally. Um, and certainly you want to argue that the mens rea element 
um, isn't just that you knowingly wrote a prescription. Every doctor knowingly writes a prescription, but the mens rea should apply also to prong two, which is that the physician's actions were not for a legitimate medical purpose. Um, you know, so I think that's important. Now, relating to knowledge, the jurors may infer that the defendant had knowledge of a fact if the jurors find that the that the doctor deliberately closed um, her eyes to a fact that otherwise would have been obvious to her. So for example, a client comes in, you know, they've got white powder all over their nose or they've got track marks or, you know, they, they're, they're wearing like a legalized t-shirt with a big pot leaf on it or whatever it is. You know, if a doctor just says, oh, here, yeah, like here, have a script. And, you know, any reasonable person would say, hey, wait a second, this, this is clearly an addict, not necessarily somebody who's just sort of has a dependence, but this is person clearly an addict. In that situation, you know, a jury can infer knowledge in that situation. So, um, you know, as indicated before, in some states, a physician may face criminal liability, even for like reckless disregard. Um, and Michael Jackson's personal physician um, in California, I think Dr. Uh, Murray, uh, he actually was convicted of involuntary manslaughter in connection with um, his prescribing and administering controlled substances. Um, and they, the court, the statute in California is without due caution and circumspection. Uh, there he allowed Michael Jackson to have access to really scary drugs and wasn't properly monitoring. Um, he was convicted and sentenced to, I think, four years in jail. However, a physician who is negligent in prescribing and should have known that the patient was lying may also face civil liability there. Um, and as Tom said, you know, for violating um, the community professional standards and a physician's duty of care. Now, you know, we're here about death penalty, I'm sorry, not death penalty, but uh, cases that result in death. Um, that this, it's not necessarily in the federal statute, a different statute, it's still governed by 841, but it's an additional element that the prosecution has to prove and it enhances punishment and penalties substantially. Um, and in that situation, um, you can basically argue that that should be something that the prosecution has to establish beyond a reasonable doubt. And it's something for the jury to decide the resulting in death. And you wanna say that since the harm to the victim is an element of the crime, um, the jury must find death or bodily injury from the use of the controlled substance, and that's something that the expert's gonna talk about in a couple seconds, beyond a reasonable doubt, maybe cite to the Apprende case. Um, and just something that I think is really important for people to know, recently the Montana Supreme Court had a case where a doctor was you know, charged with prescribing drugs to people who were clearly, clearly drug addicts. And you know, one woman was drinking three quarters of a gallon of vodka a day. Um, and what happened was the patients took the drugs that were um, prescribed by the doctor, but the patient also took other drugs because they had a real addiction problem. And the court found that um, there was a mixture combination of drugs and that there was no expert who testified for the prosecution as to which specific drug actually caused the death or whether um, you know, each decedent's combination of drugs, like was it okay for me to combine you know, fentanyl with cocaine or whatever, is, whether that was reasonable. They said, you don't have to have expert testimony all the time, but they said that the, the doctor's prescription standing alone that saying that that caused the death, that was too speculative. And you know, just about addiction and dependence, they're not the same thing. If somebody's an addict, they may lie to a doctor um, in a way to try to get anything because people are truly, truly desperate. So I see my time is up. And if anyone wants the materials, feel free to email me. Um, and that's it, Tom, you're up. Oh, I'm supposed to hand it off to Mr. Felice. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm handing it off to Joe De Felice. Hello, am I on? <laughs> Hello. You're on. You're on. They can hear you. Okay, I don't see myself. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Erica. Um, so the. I, I didn't. I don't have a PowerPoint, 
Uh, I got involved in this uh, seminar a little bit late, but uh, I did look up uh, and on some research, there were over 70,000 deaths due to drug overdoses in 2019. So the way the doctors are, with, are, are prescribing drugs is certainly something that uh, is being looked at by the government. And there have been civil lawsuits um, in Tennessee and in other places. Uh, a lawsuit was filed against Walmart in December by the Justice Department for their uh, issuing of prescriptions illegally or uh, improperly. But to get to the point of dealing with the doctor, um, the first thing you should do is get to learn about your, your client. Speak to him. Why did he become a doctor? What was his upbringing? Uh, talk to his staff. Go to his office and talk to the staff. Um, does he have any kind of a, an agreement or contract? Uh, let's call it a pain management contract, where the doctor advises his patients uh, of the dangers of abusing medications. This, because let's face it, any doctor can prescribe medications. And how do you know? How do you know? And this is something that you can always raise in your opening statement and in the trial or in your closing arguments. How do you know what this patient is going to do with this uh, drug? How do you know that instead of taking one pill a day, he's going to take three? Um, or mix it up with some other drugs. So this, this is something that you want to develop. You should talk to patients uh, and find out, did the doctor discharge any patients who might have been abusing uh, drugs or, or who simply uh, sought to obtain medication for themselves or to sell it? Were there patients that were dismissed by the doctor? And there is a case that came down in, I don't know what year it was, not too long ago in the Second Circuit called uh, U.S. against Coronia, 576 F sub second 385, reversed on 703 F third 149. And that, that dealt with off-label marketing because these salespersons come in and they uh, sell the drugs and talk to, to the doctors about the drugs and alternative uses for the drugs, okay? Uh, so the Second Circuit said it's okay for the salespersons to do that, but that, as far as I know, is only the law in the Second Circuit. And a doctor, uh, you know, he, he can always argue, this is what I was told, this is what I thought the drug was for. Um, you have to know if the patient is gaming the doctor just to get drugs. Uh, how can a doctor be responsible for patients' abuse of drugs because the patient does not heed the doctor's uh, warnings uh, or doesn't heed the label, uh, the warnings on the label of the prescription? There's a case in New York, and it's an interesting dissent. Uh, I'm looking for the case here. Okay, that's uh, people against Stan. And I'm going to have to spell this X U H U I L I. It's 34 New York Third 357, and um, that case didn't necessarily go in the favor of the defense. Um, but uh, there is an interest in dissent by Judge uh, Wilson. And uh, he talks about uh, how, does, how does the person, the doctor know that he's given these drugs to uh, maybe 500 or 1,000 patients and how does he know that these particular two patients, it was two particular persons in this case, would be uh, miss, you know, taking these drugs uh, and misusing them, and which would cause their death. So 
that's another issue that you're going to deal with if you're going to represent the doctor, and that's in causation. And there's a case in the Supreme Court, and that case, okay, is a U.S. against, well, actually, Barrage against U.S., B-U-R-R-A-G-E, 134, Supreme Court, 881, decided in 2014. The decision was written by uh, Justice Scalia. And essentially, I want to quote the right word in here on this case. Um, essentially, he's saying that there has to be a but for for the causation. If you don't have a but for, um, you you cannot. Uh, that case had to do with uh, getting uh, enhancement on a, a sentence. So, where is it? I want to. In that case, the drug was distri distributed by the defendant. Uh, one gram he sold. And the court said the use must be but for the but for that dr drug if they cannot show that the deceased would have uh, otherwise lived but for the use of that heroin, then they wouldn't sustain it. They wouldn't sustain the uh, the enhancement of the sentence. And what you want to do is also look at the statutes uh, when you're representing the defendant. And there's a case that came out of Indiana that I thought was interesting. That's 56 Northeast 3rd, 1187, state of Indiana against Sturman. And the defense, among other things, tried to say that uh, in the indictment, they had to say how the uh, debt was caused. And the uh, actually, the lower court judge uh, upheld that and, and thought that was a good argument, dismissing the counts, which was then reversed by the Supreme Court. And they quote the Barrage uh, U.S. case, okay, and they talk about that. So where, where they, 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 they said in that case, when you're talking about causation, that the drug distributed by the defendant is not held that where that drug is not independently sufficient to cause the victim's death or serious bodily injury, a defendant cannot be liable under the penalty enhancement provision unless that, such use is a but-for cause of death or injury. So you want to argue that, and you also uh, want to talk about the legitimate medical purpose. And I know that was mentioned in a way by Erica, but legitimate medical purpose was also discussed in this Sturman case. And they said it's a very questionable term because it fails to put an ordinary person on notice as to what conduct is prohibited, as well as encouraging arbitrary enforcement of the statute. So you can play with that if you're going to be defending a doctor when you're making your arguments to a jury. And I know Tom mentioned something about using experts and researching about the experts. Well, that's very true. And if you could find something to contradict or impeach an expert. Maybe he wrote something or he knows of something uh, that he said in one place and something else in another. That's certainly good to impeach him. And I always like to use in my cases whether or not a person is giving something that's materially false in his testimony. Because at least in New York, if in the state courts, if you can show that a, that a witness and even an expert has given testimony in one particular issue 
that was materially false, the jurors can disregard part of that witness's testimony or all of it. And you can certainly grab onto that if you could find something that impeaches the witness, that makes it look like now he's given misstatements only to serve the purpose of the prosecutor. You know, how much is this witness getting from the prosecutor? Does he, how many times has he testified for the prosecution? Uh, what's his income from, from all of these testimonies? So those are issues that you want to look at. The government is only going is going to try to argue that the defendant's conduct was the proximate cause of the death, and not that it was the sole cause of the death. So this is what you're going to be facing in your trial strategy, and you you need to show or try to emphasize that first of all, how does the doctor know? that uh, this person not only taking oxycodone uh, is now also ingesting heroin uh, or some other drug, which are synergistically, I think that's the way to pronounce that word, uh, being used in his system uh, to affect him and cause the death. Um, and another thing, you know, and many times with uh, these cases where they've tried to indict people, not doctors, but people that, uh, you know, just sell drugs on the street. How do they know that the drug that they sold or dispensed actually came from that person? So um, that's another thing uh, to determine. There's a couple other things. Like a doctor who is uh, being charged with a crime, he may be prescribing drugs, but uh, suppose this patient, uh, defendant, and not pa the deceased, uh, also was getting drugs from the Veterans Administration, which might be exempt from state monitoring, from the state monitoring program. Uh, how does the doctor know about that? So these are things that you could toss up to defend your doctor. And of course, you need to look at what this doctor is doing, how it's going to affect him in the case where there could be, uh, maybe has a hundred patients. And what is he doing with all these other hundred patients? And it's, what prescriptions are is he writing for these other patients? How much is he writing for them? Um, and are there basis medical basis for uh, prescribing the drugs to these patients? Or is he just acting, uh, you know, uh, giving these uh, drugs out to the patients for, for money, which is uh, what the uh, prosecution's gonna try to show. So you have to try to seize the moment, so to speak, uh, when you do your opening statement, uh, you have to talk to the jurors about this causation issue, uh, try to uh, imp impress on them how uh, the doctor has been so practical in his, in, in his uh, business transactions, that he's uh, had this pain management pro uh, contract, that he's done other things to protect uh, the patient. And and that the government is just seizing on this to make an example. Uh, because they are, as I said before, they, they've sued uh, Walmart. They've, they've also, in Tennessee, there's a Tennessee case I have here I'd like to give you. I can find it. Uh, this has got to be it. Yeah, EFLA. E-F-F-L-E-R against Purdue Pharma LP. It's a civil case. And um, Tennessee passed a special statute to protect people who have become victims of these uh, drugs, which Big Pharma, you know, uh, has been advocating for money. 
And this is another case where they said they, they wouldn't allow the prosecution or the, or the, the uh, to bring the case, but they allowed the plaintiffs to go forward with the case uh, to talk about the marketing and distribution of opioids by these uh, drug manufacturers. So the, the, you should look into things like that because if the doctor is being told by the salesperson or as to how this drug can be used or that it, it doesn't affect them and it, it's not an addictive drug, uh, this is something which the doctor can hopefully rely on to defend his case. And each, each patient has a different pain, has a different pain level. So every patient is, is different and the doctor takes that into consideration when he's prescribing the drugs and it's something that you should look at as to uh, a def defense because maybe he's giving this uh, Xanax drug to uh, one person more than he's giving it to another. And it may be for particular medical reasons. So it's, it's a question of getting all your experts together, learning about the doctor, learning about his practice, so that, and trying to use these terms, causation, legitimate medical purpose, uh, to defend your client. And of course, looking at case law and case, uh, the cases that uh, have come down in your state. So I think that's about uh, my portion of this. Uh, and I want to turn it over, I guess, to Dr. Taff. Thanks, Joe. Good afternoon, ABA. Pleasure to be here. The basic role of the medical examiner in society is to conduct six stage death investigations of any person who dies suddenly, unexpectedly, suspiciously, violently outside of the care of a physician and from drugs. The purpose of a medical examiner death investigation is to sign a death certificate which addresses the cause, manner, and time of death. After obtaining a present and past medical and psychiatric history, investigating a death scene, performing a complete autopsy, running lab tests, preparing reports and signing a death certificate. The information is put together and released into the public domain for all to read and digest. Depending on the interpretation of the results, lawyers decide to proceed with civil or criminal actions. Members of the media decide to give death, death certain amount of coverage. Lawmakers and politicians decide to make new or amend old laws. Medical epidemiologists decide to compile the information into vital health statistics. The medical profession decides to scrutinize clinical symptoms and lab test results and classify them in order to improve diagnoses and treatments. And finally, the public decides whether or not elected officials are doing or not doing their jobs with respect to public health and safety. Deaths due to chemicals and poisons such as alcohol, illicit drugs, or even prescribed medications are one of many injury or trauma categories investigated by MEs. Before the opioid epidemic got into full swing sometime between 2010 and 2015, medical examiner death investigations of drug-related deaths were fairly straightforward and uncomplicated. In general, the cause of drug deaths fall into four categories. One, an acute single drug intoxication, which everybody refers to as overdose. Two, acute multiple drug intoxication, where the decedent has evidence of cocktailing with multiple drugs. Three, a drug addict can die from medical or infectious disease complications due to drug abuse, such as liver failure due to cirrhosis, due to chronic alcoholism, or uh, cirrhosis of the liver due to hepatitis B due to intravenous drug abuse. And the fourth category of cause of death of drug addicts 
is injury or trauma while intoxicated. DWI, getting involved with fatal motor vehicle crash, uh, crashes, or being involved as homicide victims being shot during tra drug transactions that have gone bad. All, after all was said and done, the manner of such deaths were usually classified as accident or undetermined, except in those cases that were clear-cut homicides by more vital, uh, by more uh, traumatic means. Occasionally, the manner of death was categorized as suicide. A homicidal manner of death uh, in, or death at the hands of another person was exceptionally rare before 2015. In olden days, drug-related deaths for the most part were open and shut. Although it took toxicology labs weeks and months to complete the testing, uh, it, the medical investigators and examiners rarely did any other investigative work on the cases while the first death certificate and uh, the testing, were, first death certificates were pending and the uh, toxicological tests were ongoing. Final death certificates were issued with amended cause and manner of deaths, meaning there were at least two death certificates and drug deaths, only after the tox results confirmed death was due to or related to one or more drugs. End of story. Unless the deceased was some sort of a celebrity based on media standards these days, rarely, if anyone, if ever, did anyone, including next of kin, ever call or challenge medical examiners' opinions. Before 2010, there was an epidemic of complacency about drug deaths. Very few people rarely cared about deaths involving drug addicts. And all of a sudden, there was an epidemic of concern about these types of deaths. Medical examiners were forced out of their laid back attitudes and to, forced to devote more time, budgetary money, physical and mental energy investigating drug deaths. What happened after 2010? Why did so many accidental or undetermined drug tests suddenly transform into expensive, time-consuming homicide investigations? Who decided that an underground subculture characterized by many law enforcement and healthcare professionals as marginals, delinquents, willing participants, and incurables now deserves the same or even more attention than innocent homicide victims who truly died at the hands of other persons holding guns or knives or other types of weapons. I'll return to this politically sensitive subject and address how the times have changed and how such changes have affected medical examiner investigations. For those of you who are now involved in the uptick litigation of drug-related deaths, I believe in order to zealously prosecute or defend your clients, you need to know about how medical examiner death investigation systems work, the actors in the system, and the inner workings, workings of government medical labs. Since medical examiners play an important part, role in the justice system, you need to understand how they are trained, how they perform their duties, think, interact with the politics of death. And this way it will help lawyers achieve a better and fairer administration of justice. Medical examiner offices are divided into two parts. There's an investigative wing made up of physician assistants, college graduates with bachelor or master's degrees in criminology, criminalistics. And then there is the medical wing, which is the board certified or board eligible medical examiner who specialize in the area of pathology or the study of diseases. Medical examiners also use other people with higher degrees, uh, such as dentists, toxicologists, anthropologists, and radiologists. Medical examiners oversee all six stages of a death investigation. They're personally responsible for the quality, the thoroughness, the timeliness, the quality of the reports, preserving records and, and evidence, and testifying at trial. From a legal perspective, medical examiners are considered accusers, and defendants have the right to confront their accusers at trial. In other words, criminal defense attorneys must be on the lookout for prosecutorial witness substitution. Since drug deaths are considered by medical examiners to be straightforward and uncomplicated, it's not unusual for forensic pathology residents or trainees without board certification to be signed to these cases early on in their uh, training programs. By the time drug cases go to trial, these individuals have graduated and moved on from the jurisdictions 
instead of calling the graduates who oversaw the original autopsy and investigation back to testify, prosecutors bolster their cases by adopting more experienced and better credentialed medical examiners to testify at trials. For that reason, they will then turn to the, either the chief medical examiner or deputy chief with outstanding uh, credentials. Um, <clears throat> unbeknownst to uh, many lawyers, medical examiners have subpoena powers to obtain the decedent's past medical and psychiatric records because almost all drug deaths were not criminalized before 2010. Medical examiner officers rarely use their manpower time and and resources to conduct extensive retrograde behavioral reconstructions or psychological autopsies to develop decedent profiles. Since addictions are now considered controversial diseases consisting of a combination of medical, toxicological, ge uh, genetic, and psychological factors, it's important that medical examiners understand the deceased and how or his, how his or her past that is causally linked to death, especially those drug deaths that will be contested at trial. The search and collection of biographical information is cr crucial to forensic addiction medicine. Nowadays, drug addiction is considered a chronic physical and psychological disorder associated with several ongoing episodes of craving, relapse, and treatment. Most drug-related deaths represent a final acute relapse. And in my opinion, the past medical and psychiatric history is prelude to the present drug overdose. One cannot overlook, uh, at, uh, cannot look at a drug death out of context from the decedent's past. You cannot separate the mind from the body. Comorbidities is a term that's creeped into the vernacular ever since the coronavirus pandemic hit this country. As you know, the term means a person suffers from several serious pre-existing diseases that places that person in a weakened state uh, or they can die at a higher rate when exposed to another type of pathogen, tox, uh, drug, or trauma. Uh, the, in contrast, when you're dealing with drug addicts, when you're dealing with, uh, let's say, non-COVID populations, Young teens and adolescents from broken families living in poor, high crime neighborhoods of color are at risk for becoming, uh, becoming addicted to and dying either from drugs or indirectly from infectious and medical complications. If drug abusers make it into their uh, later life, into their 50s or 60s, usually they suffer from multiple mood and physical disorders. Since medical examiners have public health role, I ask, Shouldn't these comorbidities be included in investigative and in autopsy reports, as well as on the death certificate? Comorbidity information will contribute to more accurate annual and uh, vital health statistics, statistics so that social policies can be tailored made to direct resources towards the community. The second phase of a death investigation is the actual crime scene or the death scene where the body is found. In, uh, in the past, medical examiners did not spend much time exploring the forensic geographic issues uh, involving a drug overdose. Focus was always on the body, but because federal, state, and local prosecutors are now treating drug deaths as homicides, MEs have been compelled to spend more time on the geographic crime mapping as it relates to the who, where, when of fatal overdoses. So that means medical examiners have got to spend more time figuring out the distances between where drugs have been taken, the time between administration of drugs, and also look at other so-called soft evidence like text messages, cell phone records, personal emails, pharmacy receipts, uh, bill, bar bills, ATM receipts, et cetera. If drugs have not been flushed down the toilet or confiscated by family members prior to the arrival of the ME and the police, Investigators must still photograph and seize drug evidence. They have to take in the glassine bags, which all frequently have the drug dealer's identifying stamp. They should all be photographed, inventory, and then eventually sent off to the lab. Uh, you may even want to try DNA and latent prints analysis off the surface of glassine bags 
and other drug paraphernalia. The transfer of the corpse from the scene to the morgue represents stage three of a death investigation. This is the autopsy, which is a post-mortem test. The autopsy is two parts, external and internal. The external exam on drug addicts is usually not too revealing. You might find a fresh injection site, some needle track scars, or tattoos that suggest that they're part of the uh, drug subculture. The internal exam is not much more interesting than the external exam because in those cases, you might find engorged uh, organs filled with blood. Uh, you might find stomach contents with some pills or pill residue, or you might find some enlarged uh, lymph nodes. But once that is done, the specimens are collected, body fluids and tissues and sent off to the toxicology lab, which is stage four. The lab, after several weeks and months, they issue their findings. Depending on the lab you send it to, some labs will send out uh, 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 either just uh, laundry lists of findings without quantitative levels. There are only a few labs that will explain to uh, lawyers what the drugs mean. Uh, in, when you're dealing with the tox labs, you have to take in many variables as to when the drug was collected, how it was preserved, who did the testing, et cetera. Uh, one of, in, my, in my many years of experience investigating these deaths, the majority of decedents have had multiple drugs in their system at the time of the death. They have been cocktailing prior to death. Um, and the reason why they're taking these drugs is because they're, suffering, they're using the drugs for enhanced pleasure enhancement or pain reduction. If a drug like fentanyl or heroin is found in low levels, prosecutors frequently turn a blind eye to all other types of drugs present in the screen and ignore the realities of synergism and the long-term effect of uh, chronic drug abuse. Uh, the, if criminal investigations find a street or physician drug dealer in position, possession of certain types of illicit drugs, they're also present in the corpse and at the scene. They, the prosecutors will conclude that but for the presence of that drug, the deceased would still be alive. Uh, prosecutors have come up with their own hierarchies of drug uh, danger, uh, danger and fatality. Since stage five of a drug-related uh, death refers to creation preservation of the record, the Emmys are the custodians of the evidence and uh, lawyers should definitely make appointments to go to the Emmys office to check out the primary autopsy evidence. The sixth stage, the last stage, is, is the most uh, important stage, and that is when the medical examiner correlates stages one through five in a holistic approach and signs the death certificate. It must be remembered that human bodies do not normally produce alcohol or heroin or anything else. Uh, all their blood, if you test them while they're alive, a normal person not taking drugs, their blood and urine is zero percent. Uh, the presence of multiple drugs in a dead person's body signifies several things. The deceased is a long-standing drug addict who needs more and more drugs to achieve his eye. The deceased was experiencing a, an exacerbation of underlying mood disorders. The deceased was binging and out of control. And the deceased possibly intended to commit suicide. In my opinion, the type of uh, drug, number of drugs, and high levels represent non-verbal toxicological intent to cause serious bodily harm. In general, the immediate cause of death and drug deaths is not a problem for medical examiners. The major problem is the manner of death. Medical examiners routinely, traditionally call these cases accidents or undetermined, rarely suicide. Only in the last few years, the prosecutors have usurped the authority of the medical examiner. They have labeled these cases uh, a homicides. So uh, basically, um, I just want to uh, conclude and just make one other comparison for one more second with the dram shops laws, as most of you know, where alcohol was an issue. The difference between a dram shop fatality and a drug overdose is most people are witnessed at a bar drinking and within minutes or an hour, they crash and kill somebody or kill themselves. That's a little bit more easy to call a vehicular homicide. In contrast, people who buy drugs or stash drugs they may take a certain batch of drugs and not use it for days or weeks after they purchase the drugs. So basically, uh, I recommend that these cases be carried as undetermined uh, manner of deaths. And in closing, the medical examiner is stuck in the middle of a new drug war. 
in which prosecutors are aggressively going after street, physician, and pharmaceutical company drug dealers who appear to be exploiting people suffering from serious physical and mental health problems. It remains to be seen how successful the prosecution of these individuals and companies will be in reducing or stopping deaths due to substance use disorders. Thank you. Thank you. Now, on your screen, folks, you should have a slide there indicating how you get your credit, CLE credit. And then we're going to deal with some questions that you posed. So the uh, unique CLE code for this program is MID CLE 21903. Please write this code down and enter it into the CLE code box located under the media player on the session detail page and click submit. Once again, the CLE code for this program is MID CLE 21903. That's MID CLEO21903. You must enter this code in order to receive CLE credit for attending this program. Now we have a few questions and I want to go over those with you. So the first question was from Sherry. I don't know where you're from, Sherry, but we're responding to your question now. So considering the number of deaths due to opioid use, legitimately prescribed or due to suicide, is getting the doctor a TV uh, on TV really such a good idea? It seems like one big double-edged sword. You're right about that. It is a double-edged sword, and you have to consider what your strategy is in all of these cases. And I would suggest to you that you have maybe a, a media consultant to advise you on how you can overcome negative publicity. Um, so that's just one idea that I threw out to you, and there are many others, of course. So does, does the insurance carrier defend both civil uh, malpractice and criminal charges. Uh, uh, this is from Eric. Okay, so you have to. I'm sorry. Maybe Eric wants to answer. Okay. Yeah, and, and if any of the other panelists want to chime in with their their own opinions about this, feel free. Of course. So Joe and Erica and Dr. Taft, who's my buddy over here, uh, all of you can chime in. But the next question was from Eric, I just read that to you. And what you have to do is look at your client's insurance policy to see exactly what it covers. Uh, but ordinarily it will cover medical malpractice issues. So that's the civil part of it. But or ordinarily and typically they will not cover criminal charges. That's what the law provides for essentially. So also if there are allegations of uh, intentional torts, in addition to negligence, ordinarily policies will not cover for that. Now, let's see from Eric, we have a second question. I don't know if it's the same, Eric. Uh, Mr. Liotta, you mentioned fees in the area of 500000 to a million dollars to defend. Do you require all that amount up front? Uh, if is anything uh, done on a contingency, how is the fee interfacing with the malpractice defense costs? So let me respond to that. And again, if the panelists want to respond in any way, feel free to do so. But uh, let me just say this. Uh, first of all, you want to try and get as much money up front as possible because who knows what's going to happen during your case. Uh, and you can always put money into escrow and draw down against it and have your client's permission to draw down against that amount. In a criminal case, you of course cannot accept a fee on a contingency. So that's a violation, at least of New York law. I'm not sure about other jurisdictions, but in New York, at least, you cannot take a criminal case on a contingency basis. And again, 
the malpractice costs definitely uh, relate also to the criminal defense charges. And one thing that we did not mention, you may need another attorney uh, to represent your client on any professional licensing issues. So in New York, we have the OPMC in New York, and there are attorneys who just deal with that part of a case, uh, whether it, it involves negligence or criminal charges or what have you, but they deal with the licensing issues for your client. So you may need another lawyer to do that for you, or you may be able to do that yourself. I know, don't know. But Clem K has also got a question for us. And how can you get out of representing a doctor if they were not clear to you or when uh, on when and how much they could pay and you found out uh, that their office practices accepts cash for patients. Uh, this is a mess, of course, you said. So uh, once you get into a case like that, and Eric, I guess, wants to say something about that in a second. Um, once you get into a case like that, uh, Monroe Friedman, among others, uh, had given us some lessons. Uh, he, of course, is deceased now, but Monroe, before his death, told us how we can get out of cases, even if your client has lied to you or intends to lie on the witness stand. Without writing out your client, there are means by which you can deal with that. And of course, you can always make an application to be relieved. But Erica wanted to say something about some of these questions. Oh, um, my only issue is um, in connection with getting your a client on television, um, you know, obviously that also includes taking into account um, ethics rules relating to pretrial publicity and making sure you stay within the bounds of that. Yes, I'd like to add something to that. I always recommend to all medical examiners, all that, don't try the case uh, on the courthouse steps or in front of TV cameras. You're sworn to testify in a court of law. Keep your mouth shut until you take the witness stand. And as far as obviously no expert should be working on a contingency basis. Right. Okay. I don't know if we have any other questions. Do we? Uh, let's see. There is one more question. What is the trend in fentanyl deaths here in the United States. So I, I think I'd have to turn to Dr. Tapp on that question. They're going up. They're going up. Now, are they, are they lacing fentanyl with uh, heroin and so forth? Yeah, depending on the type of drug addict and the type of problem they have. Some people just use pure fentanyl or pure heroin. Other people cocktail or they're on a binge and they just keep mixing it up. Eventually things go south and the uh, relapse ends up in death. In those seminar materials that you have before you, you will learn that uh, Purdue, for example, changed the texture and the content of right. Oxy in 2010. So it became harder to crush that right. and make it into a powder. Right. And what happened was that created a heroin epidemic, of course, because people went to heroin because it was cheaper and easier to ingest than the revised oxy was. Let's see, we got another question from MS. Uh, should a doctor always assert Fifth Amendment rights in a civil action, not opioid or, and or, or Rx related uh, when there is a criminal investigation pending indictment uh, related to What's the rest of the question? Where is it? Um, Tom, if you want, I can answer that question if you, if you want. Okay, go, go ahead. Um, the question is, um, should a doctor always assert the Fifth Amendment right to it in a civil action, not opioid or RX related, when there is a criminal investigation pending indictment related to opioid RX by same doctor? So typically what we do is we make an application to stay any civil proceedings pending the federal and the um, criminal investigation, because if you do invoke the privilege, the Fifth Amendment privilege, which a defendant has an absolute right to do, if it's done in a civil case, typically there is going to be 
um, an adverse inference charge that is given in the case and your client may well lose the civil case. So we typically recommend staying all civil proceedings while criminal investigations are going on. That's one answer and I would just amplify this point. Uh, I think you have to look at the credibility of your client. Does your client have a good story to tell either civilly or criminally? Uh, we put our clients at, at the uh, permission of the United States government into the grand jury. That hasn't always worked out, but if your client's got a credible story to tell and can uh, excuse some of his conduct by his testimony, then you have to consider that. So it's not an automatic that you invoke the Fifth Amendment in these cases. Okay, what else do we have? Does the insurance carrier defend... Okay, we did that already, right? Is there any other questions? We have no other questions, folks. So with your permission, unless the panelists have anything further to say, uh, I think we're done. Thank you very much. I'm going for my second shot at the Javits Center on Pfizer today. And my wife is waiting for me downstairs in the car, so I really have to go. But I want to encourage all of you to get the vaccine. Please get the vaccine. Okay? Thank you very much. Take care. Good luck to you.